committee briefings? Or small area planning? Who's doing that? Okay. I think I, sk I skipped to briefings too fast. We have a briefing. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, Commissioners. Matt Dugan, Planning and Zoning Department. Uh, I got a briefing on the future of small area planning, which is similar to a briefing uh, Stevie Ray House presented to you all earlier this year. Yeah. Um, so um, to cover this, we're going to go over the background and charge for the overall effort to envision small area planning provide an overview of our recommendation, talk a little bit about the two areas in which we'd like to pilot test this new Imagine Austin corridor planning process, um, and then close by providing some remarks related to the relationship between small area planning process and the land development code, um, and how this whole effort relates to the legacy of our existing neighborhood plans. Um, so here's a very simplified um, version of our city's policy flame framework. Uh, we've got the charter required Imagine Austin comprehensive plan and comprehensive planning program. Um, then under that small area plans, which include neighborhood plans, corridor plans, stationary plans, and master plans, um, as well as citywide master plans. And then below that, we actually have the implementation, how to move those plans forward with how the city spends money, how the city regulates um, development, and then partnerships. Um, so small area plans have traditionally served a variety of purposes, and we anticipate that future small area plans will continue to serve many of these purposes, including Supporting creation of complete communities, providing a plan for growth in a particular area, giving the community a voice in the future evolution of particular areas of the city, providing greater predict predictability for development, investments, and overall change. Um, again, kind of the difference between planning and implementation. Uh, it's usually a small area plans typically include a vision, uh, policies that guide decision making, uh, recommended actions, and then a future uh, land use map or other maps. Um, and then implementation is done through capital investments, regulations, uh, programs, or partnerships. Uh, so in the late 90s, the city of Austin embarked on a neighborhood planning program, which has led to the creation of 30 neighborhood plans or combined neighborhood plans. Uh, over about the last decade, the city has also adopted eight specialized urban design plans, including master plans, stationary plans, and the East Riverside Corridor Plan. Uh, June 2012, the city adopted the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. Um, and then three planning and zoning departments, small area plans have been adopted since approval of Imagine Austin. A 2016 audit of neighborhood planning found several significant deficiencies in the neighborhood planning process. And while there's been a robust discussion around the findings of the neighborhood planning audit, one thing is clear, it's time for a new approach to small area planning that better meshes with the vision of Imagine Austin and is more inclusive and sustainable over time. Uh, um, in September of 2017, um, council provided additional direction um, and charged us with identifying a new approach to small area planning uh, to identify and prioritize geographic areas for small area planning along corridors that align with Imagine Austin and leverage city investments in transportation, housing, and other infrastructure. Uh, so over the last year, we've done a number of things, uh, additional analysis, survey of stakeholders, discussions with city staff, uh, distributed uh, our recommendation memo to planning commission, Zoning and Planning Commission and City Council in May. Um, they've had ongoing dialogue with boards, commissions, and council. Um, and we're currently developing initial existing conditions data and scoping material related to the year one work program. Uh, this is some of the analysis we went through, um, a wide variety of data, data sets. Um, we built a prototype of a complete community um, assessment tool that was included in the, in the packet. Um, and we use that to prioritize particular areas for planning. Uh, we've also conducted preliminary geographic analysis along Imagine Austin centers and corridors in order to identify a possible year one work program. And we're continuing to refine uh, a robust scoring system that will allow us to prioritize additional centers and corridors for future planning services. Uh, we did some outreach uh, in the spring and an online survey of existing stakeholders, uh, which is available in English and Spanish, uh, was sent out to organizations uh, all the organizations and community registry, as well as uh, throughout other channels. Um, some of the key input we got, over 40% of respondents indicated that convenient meeting times and locations would make them more likely to participate 
uh, but even more respondents indicated that they wanted assurance that recommendations will be implemented. Uh, about six to 12 months seemed to be a sweet spot for the length of a public process and willingness to continue to participate dropped off uh, after 12 months. Most people preferred to participate through online surveys. Um, and then when asked what they most wanted to see in public meetings, 67% indicated background information made available prior to the meeting was important. Uh, so these results for the survey helped us um, as we continue to flesh out the public engagement process for future small area plans. So in the memo uh, that we sent out in May, it lists a series of recommendations for our future small area planning process. I'll touch on a few of those, uh, the primary recommendations. The first is that we provide a spectrum of planning services moving forward. Um, and the spectrum includes three primary plant product lines. Uh, the first is the Imagine Austin Centers and Corridors plans. And these will be full service plans along the centers and corridors. They'd be prioritized based on uh, the ability to leverage mobility investments and other investments. Um, and these plans would typically include a future land use map and be adopted as attachments to the comprehensive plan. The second is our complete community plans. And these would be focused on immediate interventions and investments to support the creation of places where residents can meet all their basic daily needs. Uh, these plans would provide, be prioritized based on a citywide complete community analysis. Um, and they would be uh, more limited in scope than the center and corridor plans and would probably not be adopted as attachments to Imagine Austin. And then the third product line was the special studies and planning category. And these include citywide plans and special purpose uh, area planning that can be customized to a particular need. Uh, existing neighborhoods, neighborhood plans stay in place, uh, but would typically no longer be a product line that we would routinely provide moving forward. <clears throat> so we anticipate that we need to complete approximately 50 to 100 plans in order to adequately plan for all the Imagine Austin centers and corridors. Uh, based on direction from the council resolution, we recommend focusing initially on particular corridors that leverage the anticipated mobility investments. Uh, the map in the slide indicate that all the designated Imagine Austin centers and corridors in yellow, uh, the location of the 2016 mobility bond investments in blue dotted lines, and the location of draft Project Connect high capacity transit corridors in red. Uh, while not every corridor would need a plan, probably around 10 plans would be needed to be developed in the short term to adequately leverage the anticipated investments under the 2016 mobility bond and Cap Metro Project Connect. Uh, we anticipate that each of the centers and corridors plan would take anywhere from 12 to 18 months to complete. Um, so we could probably do about one to two plans per year. Uh, looking at year one, based on preliminary geographic analysis, we've identified two possible corridors that we could begin pilot testing the new corridor planning process. Um, these would be North Lamar, Tech Ridge to 183, and South Pleasant Valley, um, East Riverside to William Cannon. Uh, both corridors are designated Imagine Austin activity corridors, um, and they've also been identified for investment under the 2016 mobility bond, as well as Project Connect. Uh, both corridors have land use entitlement and other characteristics, which we believe can allow them to benefit from corridor-based small area planning. And moving forward with these corridors would also provide geographic balance and provide two fairly distinct settings in which to try out the new small area planning process. Um, so the regulations and land development code um, through zoning is a key method by which small area plans are implemented. Um, depending on what is ultimately recommended by the city manager related to a future revision of the land development code and the anticipated timing of those revisions, um, this implementation, implementation can occur um, in one of several ways for future small area plans. Uh, the first option would be something we did for North Shoal Creek where we did the policy plan, we had the future land use map that guides future zoning decisions but leaves the existing zoning in place. A uh, second option would be to develop a policy plan, um, a development of a regulating plan or an overlay zone, uh, which would create a unique set of standards in the area. Um, an example of that would be um, UNO or the East Riverside Corridor Plan. And then a third option would be to develop a policy plan um, and select rezoning through a zoning ordinance. Um, example, that would be neighborhood plans prior to the adoption of Imagine Austin. So our neighborhood planning legacy, um, the existing neighborhood plans, contact teams, neighborhood plan combining districts, and land development code provisions stay in place. Uh, we'll be shifting to the new, three new planning product lines, the Imagine Austin Centers and Corridors plans, uh, the complete community plans, or the special studies. Um, councils to direct us to update or create new neighborhood plans if needed. Um, and then the October 17th memo included 
um, a detailed set of responses to questions related to the legacy of existing neighborhood plans. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, questions, comments? Commissioner McGraw? Well, I'm definitely somebody who wanted to get into this, and I, I think what's really um, What's of great concern to me is that it, I'm wondering, um, looking at the resolution by council back in December or in September of last year, and I don't see that it says, give us some new planning products, I think is what you're calling them, because we don't want to do neighborhood planning anymore. And I see neighborhood planning is going away but I think staff just decided that, and I don't understand uh, where we are with the council on neighborhood planning. Because they did not say in this resolution to eliminate it. They said do some new things, but they didn't say eliminate it. So maybe you can explain to me um, all of the neighborhoods that are not already planned as neighborhoods are going to, it looks like on the map they're going to have corridors planned but not the neighborhoods. So I'm just trying to understand wh why we're stopping neighborhood planning and what we intend to do about the areas that lie outside of the area that's been planned. Uh, okay, so I think, I think those questions were addressed in the October 17th memo and the November 30th memo. Um, but going back to the council resolution, and maybe, maybe that's a better question for, uh, for council to answer, but based on that resolution, it was a saying, hey, go focus your planning efforts along the corridors where there's bond investments, where there's affordable housing investments, where there's other investments. The council said that? That's the resolution. Well, it was to support, um, right, but they didn't say get rid of neighborhood planning. Nobody's saying that. Well, that's where we are, though, now. At, you said that at the MITAI, uh, and you said it tonight. We don't intend to go forward with neighborhood planning. So what I'm trying to understand is if we don't do neighborhood planning and we're only going to do quarters and centers, um, what about those neighborhoods that never got a plan that lie outside the neighborhood planning area? Um, what happens to those? areas how are they involved in any planning sure so so what i said is so uh, for existing neighborhood plans the contact teams any of the land development code provisions related to land develop, related to neighborhood plans mm -hmm. those all stay in place none of that changes they can be changed i understand that that's what code next said that's they no can be none changed. of that none of that changes is what i'm saying it can be changed though they can be changed i understand that but, uh, what, what i did said is moving forward uh, we're going to do, we're going to focus on three new planning products, the centers and right. corridors plans, the complete community plans, the special studies plans, um, but the typical neighborhood plan that will not be a, a product line that we, okay. that we move so, forward. So what do we do with those places that people live in that are outside of the neighborhood plan area? What happens to those areas? So yes, that was one of the many things that, that the audit identified is that our neighborhood plans were not uh, feasible, they were not equitable, they were not representative. Um, so the areas outside of the central um, core were not receiving planning services. Okay, so you're saying outside of the core people are not receiving planning services, so how would they receive planning services under what's being proposed for small area planning? Uh, by doing centers and corridors plans in those areas. What about neighborhoods, places where the people live? Um, so based on the council direction, it, it's to focus on our planning efforts along the corridors where the city's making um, capital investments through the mobility bond. Okay, so the people who live in the neighborhoods have made their investments in their neighborhoods. Are they not part of this anymore? I mean, everybody would be a part of it. Okay. I'm not getting anywhere. Sorry. So, uh, so Matt, can you, could you go back a couple of slides where, yeah. where you had, um, I think there was one where you said if, if council directed you to either create or modify 
neighborhood plans. Let's go to that one. Update or create neighborhood plans if directed, right? Right. So let me see if I can uh, phrase it differently. So we have a council resolution. Staff's understanding is they want you to focus the F planning efforts on the areas that we have um, that we have decided to improve infrastructure and so on. Yes. Right. And and so you've come up with these three lines, uh, three products for planning. But if council in the future decides to direct you to create neighborhood plans, that that's what you guys will do. But that's not your yes. focus right now, based on that resolution. Correct. I don't know if that helps at all. Or well, not. it seems to me that council passed a resolution in 1997 saying we're going to do neighborhood planning, which we've been doing all this time, but they never passed a resolution saying stop neighborhood planning. Staff has made that determination as far as I can tell. And what I'm trying to understand is, let's say that, that people live in a place that's yellow on this map and not blue, meaning they don't have a neighborhood plan. What is a... Is a complete community plan something like that? I mean, I don't know what that is. Is that supposed to be the new term for neighborhood plan or what, you know? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Good evening, Stevie Great House Planning and Zoning. And I think this map is a good jump in point. This map basically represents the direction that staff was given in 19, about 1997 to go off and mm -hmm. begin doing neighborhood plans. We have at this point completed neighborhood plans for all of the areas shown in dark blue on this map. Um, we have offered neighborhood planning and had a process suspended in the area shown in bright yellow on this map and then in the two areas shown in brown, which are the Allendale um, and Rosedale neighborhoods. Um, Allendale was offered the opportunity to do planning and declined. Rosedale is the only kind of area left in the original 1997 council direction to do planning that we have received any direction about. Subsequent to that time, councils obviously approved a resolution directing us to provide resources for corridors and centers planning, and we had um, a, a uh, audit of neighborhood planning that was adopted in 2016 that determined that based on the resources heretofore moving forward, um, the auditor didn't think that neighborhood planning was something that we could continue to sustain with resources and provide that level of service to the entire city. So the, part of the purpose of pivoting and providing these um, corridor planning services that I think is also was implicit in council's direction under the resolution is really to prioritize and focus our resources in the areas that need those planning resources the most um, to kind of deal with emerging areas of change and areas that may need to address those changes moving forward. Um, to kind of tackle the, the last question about complete communities plans, those planning services could absolutely be provided in an area that is not adjacent to a corridor, not in a center, um, but they would probably not be structured in the same way or have the same kind of content and format that neighborhood plans past had. Hope that helps. I think that, that gets us closer. Could you comment some more about how they're different? how the complete communities are different from the neighborhood plans, either the process or the structure or the format? Sure. So I think, as Matt mentioned in his presentation, the complete communities plans would be much lighter, um, more focused interventions, a lot more focused on actually implementing actions and CIP investments and tactical investments in a particular location. They probably would not have a future land use map, as an example, um, and they probably would not be policy documents that would be adopted as part of Imagine Austin. They would be much more kind of tactical um, and focused on making specific implementation actions in a particular location to solve a particular issue. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Anderson? Thanks for being here tonight, y'all. So uh, I, I can't help but to think every time I look over these that they are completely unsustainable, and it's good to hear you guys talk about that. Um, when we show a slide that we need the 50 to 100 plans, but yet we can create one to two of these per year, and that doesn't even hit on the fact that some of our plans are about to hit 20 years old. You know, So in 1997, when we passed this, Austin's population was roughly half of what it is today, and our needs have changed immensely. So I'm de I, mean, I think Austin is desperate for you know, just totally new, need, new direction, new leadership, a new way of doing all these things. So, so what are the next steps? So it's obvious that these are complete failure at this point. 
So how do we make these, you know, if we keep going down this path, these are going to be tools of displacement. I mean, they're exclusionary zoning in their finest. And so how do we get away from that and get new ways of doing planning where we can do these faster and allow for a lot more housing where we need it and let, you know, um, uh, different things like Project Connect guide us? Like, how are we going to, you know, what, what's the plan? What are we going to do? Or are we, are we stuck? Sure. Are we just waiting to see what happens with the city manager? <laughs> I mean, I mean, some stuff I think, seems like it's on on, uh, on pause. With the, we'll have a new assistant city manager. Um, we'll have a new process to revise the land development code in early next year. Um, but but we're, we're fired up about moving in a new direction. And I think there's already a lot of stuff that's already happened. That's council direction to go say, you know, hey, go go do this stuff. We got the the bond investments. Um, we got the stuff from Project Connect, um, the housing blueprint. You know, they're going to come out with um, targets for these corridors. Um, Capital Metro has their service guidelines of what it actually takes for the number of people per acre, the number of employees per acre to support um, high capacity transit. So, trying to hit those numbers. Um, uh, Transportation Department is working on their strategic mobility plan, which my understanding is going to come up with cross sections and map those cross sections to corridors. Um, so, a lot of the stuff, a lot, there'll be a lot of, there's already a lot of policy guidance we have from Council that's a really great starting point. To, to try and move the needle on two of our biggest issues, which is housing and transportation. I know it's hard to do anything with the current land development code, but hopefully over the next 12 months we're taking care of that too. So thank you for this, and thank you for reminding us how completely broken this process is. Commissioner Seeger, then Commissioner Shaw. My question is about um, so many of the corridor plans are in the central core where we have neighborhood plans. Mm -hmm. What is the interface going to be between the corridor plan and an adopted neighborhood plan, say, where they have a flum, et cetera? What is going to be the transition, or is there going to be a transition? I'm sure there is. Sure. So, um, you know, we've got one case from East Riverside, um, corridor plan, where there, there was that situation. So a lot of, um, a lot of things we could learn from that. Um, but, um, but I think as, as part of the pilot uh, task for doing the, the corridors, um, you know, we'd really look to, um, to flesh that out and figure out what exactly, how would that exactly work. Because um, when we look at North Lamar, part of that area along that corridor already has an existing neighborhood plan and part of it doesn't. Right. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Shaw, then Commissioner Hart, then Schneider. So uh, does this proposal for the new approach for small area planning have to be approved by council at some point? Or have you, do they need to review and approve this these uh, products? So what we're proposing is that we would basically be bringing to council as we have in our past neighborhood planning efforts, um, any kind of resolution to initiate a particular planning process. So before we move forward with the pilot program to do planning in a particular corridor, that would likely be moving forward to council with a resolution to initiate that planning effort, which is similar to how we've handled um, neighborhood plan and other uh, corridor plan initiation in the past. But and, do, yeah. um, and my other question is, I'm trying to, at the pace at which we're going to be able to accomplish these plans, I mean, I, I, I think we're going to be looking at an, another stab at uh, getting a, a new land development code here in a few months. We don't know what the pace of that will be, but by the time, I mean, so we're going to have new zoning, new maps, and we're going to give a lot of thought to what, um, what these corridors should look like, transition zones. I'm sure we're going to have all those discussions. And then this comes in later. I'm just trying, it just seems like um, it's a little too late by the time we do some of this. We're already with the new code and we've already given all the thought to what these corridors should look like. Or is, anyway, I'm just not, I'm thinking it may be too late <laughs> by the time uh, we implement all these corridor plans. Well, I think with the, the pilot program particularly, we're hoping that we'll know, at least have some sense of what the toolbox might look like. And if not knowing the toolbox, knowing what the process to get there is. Um, so in that sense, I don't think it's too late at all. I think it's it will be good to have the toolbox decided upon as we're moving forward to apply and create a policy plan. So you think we might be able to use that in developing the land code or the 
kind of a mapping strategy or is that what you're saying? Well, I'm kind of saying it's sort of a circle. I'm thinking about it the other way around where it is nice to be able, to, if, even if these plans should have a regulatory element to it, it will be nice to know what toolbox we're working from. So as Matt mentioned on um, one of the slides in the presentation that we have several different ways that we could implement planning with regulations. Um, we hope to know sort of where the, the process to develop revisions to the land development code is headed. Um, so that we can recommend the right set of tools as part of this process and how to go about implementing with regulations. I would just add to that kind of, um, I haven't done this at other, other places, you know, best practices, you, you do a comprehensive plan or you update your comprehensive plan, then you do your, um, your uh, you update your zoning code, then implement your comprehensive plan, and then you also align your CIP investments with your comprehensive plan. Um, so. so if I could expand on that, just on that question, because it's going to be important for us to know if we're going to be tackling another mapping exercise. We were almost mapping the corridors, maybe a light version of the mapping. So it would be important for us to know our role and know where to stop planning um, to allow these future corridor plans to, to take their course. Because either we're getting too far ahead or you're getting too far behind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let's see. Are, are you envisioning us not doing what we did a few months ago? Uh, that, uh, that I'm not sure of. Um, well, I kind of look at the past of Austin's planning uh, process. It seems like we've, kinda, we've jammed planning and implementation together. Um, and a lot of times we have the policy discussion as well as the implementation discussion at the same time. Um, and theoretically, you know, on paper, it's you know, policy and planning is done with the community and then implementation is technical and really done with staff. Um, but in Austin, we, we do it. Um, we have that discussion on policy and implementation um, at the same time, every time, it seems like. So I think one of the things we're trying to do is kind of um, you know, separate the planning from the implementation. Um, so that, you know, the most recent example would be North Shoal Creek. Went through the planning process, came up with the future land use map, but did not do the zoning that goes along with that. Okay. Yeah, and I think that the other thing that I would add is we don't necessarily have the luxury of waiting, and I think I've said this before probably in the, <laughs> this room, we don't have the luxury of waiting until we have the perfect policy framework to develop an implementation strategy for it. So I think it's a continuous process where you are continuously trying to make sure that how you are implementing your policies with regulations and CIP investments are doing the best job they can to implement the current policy framework while you're continuing to revise um, that policy framework over time to make it make more sense. So I, I don't think it's, we're not gonna be able to wait for an entire new set of policy framework to come into existence um, before deciding how to implement. Yeah, no, that's fair. I, th I think we're gonna have to have a discussion about what is our role? Are we gonna be doing some planning during the revision of the land development code. And I'm, I'm not clear about it yet. Commissioner Hart? I was gonna echo a lot of Commissioner Anderson's statements and thank you for being here. And I think bringing up the North Shoal Creek plan that was here very recently exemplifies some of the issues that we have today where there's this very long, drawn out, engaged, thoughtful process that still results in the final product that seemed to have a lot of discord between direction from staff, expectations in the neighborhood, and then expectations of what everything should have looked like from up on the dais. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how the new process shakes out. Do you have any current prioritization on the corridor mapping? Um, so uh, we built a, we call it a, more of a prototype of a prototype to, to test with, and we would call it a complete community assessment tool. It was very simple. We measured four things, kind of the distance to an elementary school, a grocery store, a park, and a high-frequency transit stop. Um, and the, the city of Orange provided the city up, and I think um, uh, there were 17 districts in the city and then another seven outside of the city limits. Um, so that very basic, very rough prototype, it kind of showed us areas that we thought might need a little more, um, a little more attention. So and areas that are the, highly incomplete or? Yes, yeah. Um, and then we can kind of look at areas that had um, center our corridor, areas where we're getting bond investments, um, and areas that already had uh, planned for high existing, high frequency transit. Okay. And how would you say that the general public can be involved with shaping the new process at this point? Is it feedback to their council members, feedback to you guys? 
I think it's it's going to be that, but it's also going to be feedback during the process yeah. because we really are making wanting to make sure that sort of whatever first quarter plan we hit start on um, in the new year is going to be a pilot process with the notion that we probably won't do well maybe it'll be perfect you know who knows maybe we'll get we'll hit it out of the park from the get-go and that'll be the process we repeat you know from now on but probably not um, so the notion of having folks as engaged and possible as possible in that process so that we can kind of ask questions of ourselves and of the folks that have engaged in that process as we go um, and suggest changes and improvements to how we do um, the next of the corridor plans that we take on I'm sorry if I missed this do you have that prototype identify it and a timeline around it um, so at this point we're, we're looking um, probably will be seeking some sort of council action in the springtime um, to initiate a possible year one um, pilot in the North Lamar corridor okay. thank you both. Commissioner Schneider then Shaw hi I, I noticed uh, that you did some study on the best ways or what people would how people would engage in these processes and uh, um, I, I really appreciate that um, I also noticed that the survey respondents were really heavily weighted for the people who were always deeply engaged in these processes and um, I wondered if you had any thoughts about how we can make sure that as as we're doing these we get a more 360 view or you know, we make sure that we're hearing from the people who don't regularly go to their neighborhood association meeting or, you know, we're not super engaged. Sure. That, the preliminary um, survey that you referenced in the, in the packet was really kind of designed to gauge feedback specifically from those folks that um, know what the planning process is already and have some particular feedback based on their own lessons learned experiencing that process. But moving forward with um, engagement in the corridor plans um, and in the other planning products, we would definitely be looking to do a more um, expansive engagement process that's probably a little bit closer to the type of process that was done um, during development of the Imagine Austin Comprehensive plan um, where we work to engage um, broadly try to reach out to underrepresented groups try to keep track of the extent to which we're being successful um, in engaging and listening to and seeking out input um, from folks that aren't kind of traditional um, frequent flyers of our planning process if you will and I think that the North Lamar corridor and actually all of the corridors on that map because they have existing high capacity transit routes already um, serving them will kind of you know there's some sort of built-in engagement that can be done to engage riders that are experiencing you know that route um, we've had some preliminary conversations with Austin Public Health about the amount of um, activity they're already out every day doing in terms of assessments and being able to be in contact with some of the vulnerable populations that wouldn't otherwise um, get involved in a planning process so I think we're going to be a lot more um, kind of creative and nimble in how we approach um, stakeholders and sort of what our definition of stakeholder is for the process which does which is not to say that we won't continue to engage the traditional stakeholders um, just that we'll have a whole additional kind of layer um, on top of that of additional stakeholders I, I really appreciate that uh, and I, <clears throat> obviously it, you know it's really complicated especially when you're talking about corridors uh, built around transit you're going to want to engage people who uh, or maybe renters or who rely you, you want to oversample people who are relying on transit um, uh, and I'm not sure that those voices are typically included um, so I appreciate that thank you Commissioner Shaw I think Matt I think I heard you say this a lot we're going to have a lot of metrics from these policies strategic housing blueprint uh, the mobility plan there's going to be a lot of goals set that will inform what you guys do in these corridors but I think to your, our, your what we were discussing earlier they'll also inform how we approach any work we do because those will be our kind of our goals for whatever affordable housing goals are in each district uh, we'll try to be achieving those as we move through the new development code process so I think we'll be playing by the same set of goals is what I'm trying to say yeah. um, so that's a good thing mm -hmm. Commissioner McGraw. So a couple of things. I have to uh, <clears throat> disagree with my colleague. Neighborhood planning, in my opinion, is not a failure. Thousands of people have participated. And um, I'm one of the things that has come from those plans is that every plan has a lot of information. It's almost 
I think this uh, last one that we saw was just a tremendous plan. It was wonderfully done. But I think a neighborhood plan could actually be done a little slimmer. You know, I think it had a lot of information. But I also know that all the neighborhood plans are used to inform the CIP process, and that is not a failure. I think that has been a tremendous asset to really um, let the local people say, you know, where do we really need sidewalks and bikeways and things like that, and where do we have flooding? And so I think the neighborhood plans have been a tremendous asset. And I'm sorry that, that other neighborhoods will, uh, I suppose, will no longer get neighborhood plans since staff has decided not to do them. Uh, it appears to me that we've had funds for neighborhood planning all these years, and every year or so the, the council has approved the next plan. Is that right? The, the council decides what are the plans that are coming up. And it sounds like now staff is saying, no, we want that money for quarter plans. We don't want any more neighborhood plans. We want to go to council and say, we want quarter plans, and we're taking those resources over here to quarter plans, which I understand from neighborhood housing is where we go reach into the neighborhoods a quarter to maybe a half a mile, which will take out a lot of neighborhoods, and uh, decide what's going to happen to them via a quarter plan. So that's, that's how I'm understanding this change. Um, so is that right with the money that the resources are, the neighborhood planning resources now will become these planning resources? I, I think I would kind of respond that our budget currently, when council adopts an operating budget for our department, specifies resources per division of our department, and one of those divisions is the small area or the long range, long range planning division name keeps changing. But one of those divisions that has traditionally been responsible for neighborhood plans is the Long Range Planning Division. However, the neighborhood plans have not typically been developed with consultant resources, so that's not an individual neighborhood plan is not usually a line item in the budget that council adopts for our department. They're adopting funding for a particular amount of um, FTE that do the work that is directed by council through resolution or other action or development or are directed by city manager. Um, we haven't had specific amounts of money targeted to particular neighborhood planning efforts. But, but the council does say these are the next neighborhoods to receive planning. Isn't that still the way that's been done? They have initiated them through resolutions. So, for example, the North Shoal Creek Plan, which was the last of the neighborhood plans that we have adopted, was initiated by resolution several years ago, and that resolution would initiated um, both the North Shoal Creek Neighborhood Plan as well as some planning work that was undertaken um, in the Burnett Road corridor. But it hasn't been like a rolling annual work program of plans. It's really been on a plan-by-plan -plan basis working down that map that was originally kind of enshrined in 1997, providing direction to staff to right. go take on the next plan. Right, but that's been by council resolution. So Correct. in the coming year, the intention is we're not going to we're not going to get the council to decide what neighborhood plans. We're going to get the council to decide we're doing quarter plans. That's my, my understanding, is that it's kind of the same division, the same pot of money. Our resources are now going to go to quarter plans if the council approves that. Is that correct? I think what I heard you I say was, uh, is that um, council approves so many FTEs for your department and the different pieces of the department, and that the planning efforts are directed by council. So in this case, you have the resolution that directs you to do the three different, or, or to come up with a different way of, of planning areas that are uh, being invested in. And so um, it's not that councils has, when they're approving the budget, that the next thing we're gonna do is these two neighborhoods, right? Correct. Well, they don't, they don't do it during the budget, but they do it at some point. Right, but the last time I mean, they did it was for the Burnett, which was a while ago. And they haven't done another one. Yes. Okay. Um, so when, when you take the pilot to council in, in early spring, uh, what's, on, what's on the table? Can they say, well, you know, we're not sure about these three product tools. We also want you to do neighborhood plans. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they can... They can or, do or, or, or all that's being presented is 
this is what we heard from your resolution and here's the pilot that we want you to consider and we're recommending it. That's that would, more likely. That we would recommend initiating a pilot right. corridor plan. And that doesn't necessarily foreclose upon that being the planning solution for all time because council could just as easily the next month take action directing us to develop a new neighborhood plan or to go back and offer a neighborhood plan to one of the areas within that map. I mean, that would definitely, that's council's decision to make for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we could have continue having these discussions and, and uh, reach out to our council members too. Right. I had one more thing I just wanted to mention because you started talking about Code Next, and I think one of the things that really hurt Code Next effort was because originally it was a rewrite of the code, which is the toolbox, which tells you what kind of districts you have, and uh, we needed some new districts, and that was understood. Um, but a couple of years into the process, um, the council added the money to do the mapping simultaneously with the plan, which is really strange, in my opinion, that you would rewrite, you know, recreate the toolbox, but you're, you're mapping it all at the same time. And I think that really caused a lot of trouble. So when you say we were, we were planning the corridors, we were doing the transition zones, what I'm, uh, I think maybe I'm understanding is that the uh, attitude here is we would get a new toolbox or some changes to the toolbox, but the mapping, rather than happening right alongside, which made us, I don't know, I thought I was crazy trying to deal with that, but um, <laughs> it seems to me to be more rational if then that toolbox is used to implement planning and the planning is what you're talking to us about, is to doing the planning. So is your intention somewhat to see the toolbox tuned up and the application in the planning work rather than both of those simultaneously? I, I don't think either of us are prepared to speculate <laughs> on what is or isn't going to be the recommendation for the new um, process to rewrite right. the land development code. So I don't... I don't know that I have enough information to actually answer that question. I'm just point. wondering if that isn't a more reasonable, functional way to approach things. Because it sounds like y'all are a little baffled, too, about, well, we've got to keep going with planning, but we don't know what the toolbox is. So, um, no, and I want to actually clarify the, the what we are waiting to know about is sort of what the overall approach and time frame might be because that will help inform what we recommend for a planning product. So as an example, when we undertook the North Shoal Creek plan and made a, made a calculated decision to do just a future land use map and not try to do any kind of remapping of the zoning mm -hmm. as a corollary to that planning process, that was specifically because we anticipated that we would have a rewrite of the code and a remapping of the code mm -hmm. within a quick enough time frame that it didn't make sense to go through the process of re rezoning mm -hmm. that whole area only to redo it through a citywide effort. So it's going to continue to be um, a, a dance and it will continue to be us being aware of what that overall rewrite schedule time plane, timeline process looks like. Um, but I don't think anything that we've recommended couldn't dance in whatever way it needs to in order to make sense with what that recommended process ultimately is. Commissioner Burkhart. So, Matt, how do you envision this process happening? Are you having a stakeholder meetings and try to solicit stakeholder input for, for corridor plans or small area plans? Or you, how, how do you see that happening? Sure, and, and uh, we haven't got that far along, but I think what we're going to do is kind of step one is come up with a public participation plan. That's something we did in Imagine Austin really help with, with that process, but have that uh, public participation plan kind of go through and um, identify the stakeholders, identify the process, you know, kind of scope the process. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things we've seen some, in some other cities is using different outreach and engagement techniques for different stakeholders that um, seem to be better suited for their their needs. Uh, but we haven't we haven't gotten that far yet. So I, I guess where I'm going with this is you know I at some point you know we we'll, we're in the situ in the in the um, circumstance of crying wolf. I mean we people have you know spent a lot of sweat and blood and energy on neighborhood plans over 20 years using more or less that same methodology. You know, and 20 years down the road, all of a sudden we say, well, never mind, let's start over with something else. And, you know, and, and all, I, all I'm saying is, um, in addition to the, to the incredibly optimistic time frame that you've got, I mean, you're looking out 25 and 50 years on this. 
you know, I, I, I can't help but think, again, that, that uh, some future commissioner will say, well, look what they've done and why have they done it this way. And, and, you know, this is totally messed up and let's just start over. And it will happen. I mean, it's inevitable that it will happen. And so the point I wanted to make, frankly, is that, you know, the charrettes that we went through on the mapping were profoundly instructive. And if you were to do anything, it seems to me you know, that, that you, this should be a triage almost simultaneously all at once rather than a protracted process over 20 years. An excellent opportunity to engage the community, but, but really, you know, really the city won't wait. So you know, the actions need to be taken as quickly as they can be choreographed. And I, I just, I'm just astonished that we'd be looking at something that would be as methodical and rote and, and, um, and, and not forward, not as forward-looking uh, methodologically as we could be if we can get in, if we can get in and do it. That's my thought. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Sure, I know we're hoping to wrap up. So uh, I'll be the one that says that. Yeah, I mean this is obviously so broken, and we don't have 50 years to get through these. And unless we're going to send eviction notices to the bottom three quarters of our income earners in Austin, which is kind of the trajectory we're on without real change and real leadership. So um, there's no way other cities that are growing deal with what we're dealing with as far as like coming up with such an arcane process where nobody's allowed housing where they want to live and we make housing so inefficient and impossible that it doesn't really happen like it needs to. So just really challenging you guys to quickly come up with whatever looks like we've talked about maybe a citywide flum where we can just go in at one time and kind of just update the entire city and allow for responsible land development once again just trying to get there but understanding the city's change and evolve and not being afraid of it is a good thing thanks any other comments thanks so much thank you um, the small area planning report that the staff did was sent to us May 14th. And I just wanted to reiterate that we were right in the very middle of Code Next. Do y'all remember how many hours we met? And it came to us as an email that said, oh, here's a small area planning report. We had no briefing or anything. So um, this is one reason I was very confused about all this, and so I really appreciate having some more time to talk to staff and having y'all come back and, and really enlighten us a little bit more on this process. Thank yeah, you. and I'd say thanks for sharing the communication, Commissioner McGraw, because that was helpful for me to just see kind of what's transpired in the last mm -hmm. hour long. So, so can I, I thought, unless I was imagining, didn't you guys present to us in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We did have a presentation, and it, it was very close to what we saw today. So, I, uh, you did present on this previously, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank I, you. I think the thing that got me really lost was that I couldn't find neighborhood planning anywhere, and it didn't seem to be overtly. We are now getting rid of this. It was just you can't find it. So I I really needed the clarification, and I appreciate it. Thank you. 